So somehow I missed at the start of March that last month was uh, Women in History Month and decided it would be a good thing to talk a little bit about women in the history of ornithology. And there were way more than I'm covering, uh, but I'm going to cover five of them and a little bit about some of the birds that they studied. Um, but several of them studied a whole mess of birds, so it's actually a little ridiculous to pretend that these five birds really were representative of what they did. Um, thank you for supporting my work. I'm really honored that so many people are helping uh, cover the expenses of my blog and my podcast. And I'm so happy to be able to do a program once a month to thank you for it. I'm going to start, we're going to do a timeline tonight. And so I'm going to start with me and my grandpa. Uh, he was born in 1896 and he died in 1970, quite possibly because of the tragic 69 Cubs. He couldn't make it beyond that. So um, he saw the Cubs win the World Series twice, the last time in 1908 when he was 12 years old, but he never saw them win after his childhood. Now I'm going to go to me and my brother. That's my brother Jimmy and me. And when we think about women in ornithology, we often think about how they were uh, the ones who uh, tried to get people to stop shooting birds. And we get these stereotypical ideas about men and women in the outdoors. And my brother and I were probably the quintessential stereotypical pair of children in some ways. He loved to go fishing on our little creek in our town and when he didn't have friends who could go with him, he would let me tag along. And he was my big brother, so of course I wanted to go with him everywhere. He often brought two fishing poles, but there was no way on earth that I would have held a fishing pole that actually had a hook and bait on the end. I did not want to be responsible for the deaths of a single earthworm or a single fish. And Jimmy always wanted me to hold a pole because that would double our chances of getting something, but I absolutely refused. I had worms for pets and there was no way I was going to hurt a worm. So that was um, us. When he got his first Daisy air rifle, he was probably just a few years older than he, we are in this picture. Uh, I would shoot with him. We would do target practice in the backyard using tin cans, and he would order all these targets. And I would shoot at any bullseye target. And I was really good, too. I was as good as him. So. You know, it was always a close competition until he would put in a target that showed a deer or a silhouette of a person, and there was no way I was going to aim at those. So that makes me sound like the girl, the passive follower, and he's the active boy, except I was sticking to my lights. I, I was no follower. I liked playing with my big brother, but I liked playing on my terms. And I didn't care if I lost. I cared more about what I was standing up for. So um, I know lots of men. My father-in-law never hunted after he was a boy. They were poor. They lived on a farm. They did a lot of hunting, but they shot a deer once. I don't remember if it was my father-in-law or his dad or his brother who killed a deer. The deer didn't die right away. And my father-in-law 
heard it scream and he could never shoot anything after that, except sometimes he, he kept his shotgun and he would use bird shot sometimes to scare away bears from their yard. But he did not enjoy hunting. And that was just the way he was. My grandpa came home from World War I and never, ever held a gun again in his life. My uncle quit hunting after he winged a mallard and she died in his lap and he watched the light go out in her eyes. And he would tell me that story at every single um, family thing. As soon as he'd had just enough beer, he would tell me that story again. Uh, it's not a male or female thing. One of the women I'm not talking about tonight, but I could, is Fran Hammerstrom from Wisconsin. She loved hunting. And she was one of the people who was one of the biggest proponents of Wisconsin having a morning dub season because she loved shooting them and she loved eating them. So it's not a male female thing. Um, but women that I'm going to talk about tonight had some really serious constraints. Now, the American Ornithologist Union started in 1883 be, uh, before my grandpa was born. And it was men only. And we think, well, yeah, but it was only men only for two years. And that the first woman was admitted, and I'm going to talk about her uh, tonight. She joined in, uh, she was admitted as a voting member in 1885. The Cubs won the World Series in 1908. Every single woman I'm going to talk about tonight um, was alive when the Cubs won that World Series. Um, uh, and all of the, not all of them were still alive when women got the right to vote. Women did a lot of critical things for bird conservation. Not one of them could do it from a position in Congress, and not one of them could use her vote to say how she wanted things to do to work out. They had to work in from a fairly powerless position, but they did great things. The Migratory Bird Act was passed in 1916, and that was a critical thing that women fought for, even though not one of them could vote when that was passed. Well, we're going to go back in time to John James Audubon. That's where our timeline's going to begin in 1785. And the reason I'm bringing him into the picture, he um, is a very complicated person. And my friend Drew Lanham wrote a brilliant article about him in, I think, the current Audubon magazine. You can find it online. It is just fascinating. But Audubon was a very inspirational person for people who loved birds because he painted them. He went around the country and painted these vivid birds. We actually have this print in our living room of this wonderful pileated woodpecker family with two baby boys on the bottom and the dad on the trunk, the lower one, and the mother on the top with the caterpillar. Uh, you could tell she's the only female by her black forehead and black eye line. And I use this picture because the Pileated Woodpecker is the American Birding Association's Bird of the Year. But Audubon never painted a bird without shooting it. He would watch the birds in the field, and you can tell by the interactions that he shows and the behaviors that he, he was watching them. He didn't have binoculars. And the only way he could clearly see all the markings was to first watch them and then shoot them. And you look at pictures like this, uh, his Carolina parakeets, and they're extinct now. But you can look at that bottom bird looking straight at him in the eye. And all these birds, and he got the plumage details because he shot them. And he stuffed the bodies and ate the innards um, 
you know, he didn't have places to go shopping while he was in the wilderness. So he had to eat a lot of the birds that he shot too, but he painted them. But the mindset for bird study always involved shooting. And here's another hero of mine, George Mick Sutton, who was born two years after my grandpa and lived till 1982. And he, uh, here he is on the timeline. And um, he wrote, he drew the most charming paintings of baby sparrows. That's how I first learned about him. But he was the man who, um, was the first ornithologist to see the eggs of Harris's sparrow up on Hudson Bay. And listen to the way he wrote about it in his Adventures of an Ornithologist in 1936. As I knelt to examine the nest, a thrill, the like of which I had never felt before, passed through me, and I talked aloud. Here, I said, here in this beautiful place, at my fingertips lay treasures that were beyond price. Mine was man's first glimpse of the eggs of the Harris the Sparrow in the lovely bird's wilderness home. Well, he was almost definitely not the first man to glimpse those eggs. If a Native American hadn't seen them first, I'll be a monkey's uncle. But um, he was so poetic about it, except in the account he wrote, about the specimens he provided the Carnegie Museum. Uh, he wrote about the female, how he found that nest with the eggs. The bird flew directly from the nest without any attempt at feigning injury. It perched on a dead spruce bough about 20 yards away where it wiped its bill. It gave no alarm no note. The bird, a female, was collected at once to make identification certain. That means he shot her. And he also collected that nest and those beautiful eggs in that sacred spot. It's so hard for me to wrap my head around that, but that was the way people learned about birds. Um, there was a huge toll on the number of birds by scientific collecting, but a huger one from people collecting birds for shadow boxes and just bird and egg specimen collections. It was shocking how many people collected birds back then. And the third way that people did scientifically and just collecting, but also they were shooting them for their feathers to use on women's hats. And I don't have any of the gorgeous, stunning pictures of egret egrets, but I got this one in Florida of a great egret and this one of a snowy egret. Those feathers were prized for women's hats in the 1800s. It was so popular and I, I'm mortified. I can't remember the name of uh, I think she was an opera singer who would um, give tickets or uh, her autograph or things like that if women promised never to wear feathers in their hats again. Uh, that second woman, you can see it's a whole bird that she has on her head. It was strange and bizarre. And a lot of people blamed women for the declines in birds. And they certainly were hugely responsible because of the uh, egrets, egrets for declines in some wading birds. But like I said, those birds were also being collected by just people who called themselves collectors and their eggs were being collected and then there was scientific collection. But one of my favorite movies was set in the 1890s, Hello Dolly, and they couldn't use illegal feathers when they did her costumes. I think it was Edith Head who did the costuming, but her hats, um, they used chicken and game bird feathers and turkey feathers and stuff and they dyed them and did stuff to make the um, textures look authentic 
but it was astonishing how popular it was to have dead birds on your head back then. And that expression of the real feather in your cap came from that time. Florence Marion Bailey was born in 1863, so quite a bit before my grandpa was born. And she, as a child, had a big brother. He was older, he was eight years older than her. My brother was only two years older than me. And a father who were both passionate scientific collectors. And indeed her, um, when she was nine, she went with her father and older brother on a two month collecting trip to Florida. She's considered the first lady of ornithology and stuff, but she had an inside uh, angle because she, uh, thanks to her father, she had done a lot of collecting or been along for a lot of collecting and she got to meet a lot of prominent ornithologists. So when her, but she also did not like the idea of shooting the birds to study them. She wanted to start studying them in the field while they were like still alive. So you could learn about their songs and you could learn about their nesting behaviors, not just find the nest and kill the mother and collect everything. And so she wrote a book birds through an opera glass. At that time, she was single. Her name was Florence Merriam. And this was in 1889. And this was the first field guide, a book designed to help people figure out birds without killing them. Uh, Roger Torrey Peterson was decades behind Florence Merriam. Um, Thanks to that book um, and other things she did, she was admitted to the AOU in 1885, nominated, I believe, by her brother. Um, but so here's her first book and here's what opera glasses looked like. They were something ladies could have. Um, and binoculars were more of military equipment back then and optics were expensive so it was something upper class people could do much more than poorer people but she also worked tirelessly to get the migratory bird treaty act passed people give two different dates 1916 or 1918 i think it has to do with when congress voted for it versus when it went into law, but it was passed in 1916. And she also was one of the many people who worked to make duck hunters and goose hunters uh, support the habitat that they needed to ensure that we would continue to have ducks and geese to shoot at. Uh, that was the very first migratory bird hunting stamp. It cost a dollar in 1935. She wrote another book, Birds of Village and Field, a bird book for beginners. That was in 1898. And then in 1899, she got married and her husband was the chief field naturalist for the US Bureau of Biological Survey. So now she went with her husband wherever he went and she spent a lot of time in the West. And another ornithologist named Joseph Grinnell um, named a subspecies of the mountain chickadee for her. Uh, Paris Gambolai Bailier. Uh, the thing is, he was using her married name, not like Florence or Miriam of, of the names that were uniquely hers. She wrote a book when they were living in New Mexico. She studied birds very closely there. She finished it in 1919. It wasn't published till 1928. And, um, but that book was so seminal in how it uh, made a book about a state's ornithology that she became a fellow of the AOU in 1929. And she was the first woman fellow, which is an ironic name because it sort of sounds 
exactly like it's supposed to be for men only. Uh, she was awarded the Brewster Medal, which is for um, the AOU's award for wonderful ornithological writing. She wrote more than 10 books and almost 100 articles in her life. Um, and we already talked about the, um, the bird stamp. So she was one of my very first ornithological heroes. And I really get frustrated whenever I hear anybody say Roger Tory Peterson wrote the first field guide. When I started birding, I bought, um, I discovered these books, The Life Histories of North American Birds, and they're broken down in families. So I have all, all of them. The whole top shelf and half of the next shelf are just these books. And uh, Arthur Cleveland Bent wrote all of them until we got to the Finches because he died. And so other people took over, but throughout them, he quoted all these people who sent him important accounts about how birds live. He couldn't have done this all on just his own observations. And he kept quoting this woman, Miss Althea Sherman, and he always called her Miss Sherman. She was actually born 10 years before Florence Marion Bailey in 1853. And, um, she lived, uh, uh, she grew up on a farm in Iowa. And as much as she learned about birds and plants in her farm life, she also wrote later about how many animals and plants declined with agricultural development. She attended the best college that accepted women at that time, which happens to be the college that my grandson's parents both went to, my daughter Katie and my son-in-law Michael went to Oberlin. She graduated in 1875 with a BA in art, and she also studied Greek and Latin, and she aspired to be an artist. She returned to Oberlin to get a master's degree in 1882 in art. She taught art at Carleton College in Minnesota, left to study more at the Art Students League of New York, and then she moved to Wichita to be closer to her sister. And she worked there until she had to return home because her father got sick. When he recovered, she got a job as supervisor of drawing at Tacoma Public Schools in Washington until 1895, but then her father got sick again and they needed her to come back to the farm and she ended up giving up all of her artistic ambitions at the age of 42 and was stuck at home. She took care of her father until he died and her mother needed her still. And then she just stayed there. But now she got a new interest. She was fascinated with chimney swifts. And so she had a tower built with a chimney that allowed her to look in to observe the chimney swifts nests and roosting. And she became like a world authority on chimney swifts. Uh, but she also was quoted so much, you know, by Arthur Cleveland Bent. And she also wrote a lot of articles for the Iowa Ornithologist Union. But here's a shocking fact about Althea Sherman. She trained local boys to shoot house wrens because they puncture eggs in the nests of birds she was studying. I found that heartbreaking. But she did the painting on this book. She did not, this book was published after she had died, uh, but the cover illustration was her illustration of a goldfinch. And when the Iowa Ornithologist Union was working to decide, they wanted to recommend a state bird because Iowa was one of very few states that didn't have a state bird yet. She wanted the goldfinch. She said it was a beautiful bird. 
easily recognized by everyone, and it was common in most parts of Iowa throughout the whole year. And sure enough, uh, the IOU sent a petition to the state legislature in 1933, and it was passed unanimously, and that is Iowa's official state bird. And Althea Sherman wrote more than 70 articles. She died in 1943, and her collected writings were put into book form by Fred J. Pierce, who was the editor of Iowa Bird Life, the journal of the Iowa Ornithologist Union. And the first edition, uh, I think it was only 1,500 copies, was published in 1952, but it's available in paperback from the Iowa Ornithologist Union, and it's also sold as an ebook. And it's really interesting, but I was very frustrated when I looked it up on Amazon, uh, decided to check out some of the comments that people had made about it. One person was very angry because it did not have enough, it didn't have color illustrations, it wasn't a field guide. And that's not what it was supposed to be. But anyway, when I was a little girl, the DDT truck would come through our town uh, every several nights during the summertime. And kids would hear the truck. The boys would all jump on their bicycles and follow, not all the boys. My husband never followed the DDT truck. My brother never did not follow the DDT truck. And uh, they would, tr there was a, a grab bar that you can't even see through all the, the um, DDT coming out of the truck. But if they got right up to the back of the truck and grabbed the bar, whoever did that first won. And you could see in the bottom corner an arm. There were people who just loved to go out in the DDT and check it out. And you could tell these men who are running the back of the truck, making the spray come out, aren't wearing any protection. It was shocking. Uh, the only time I ever saw an Oriole as a child in my suburb of Chicago, it was a dead one in my front yard the morning after the DDT truck went by. Rachel Carson, born in 1907, uh, the uh, the one who was born the last of all the women I'm going to talk about tonight, she was concerned about that, and that's what she is most famous for. Uh, here she is in 1907, um, born considerably after Althea Sherman and Florence Marion Bailey. And Rachel Carson um, earned her bachelor's degree at the Pennsylvania College for Women in 1929. She'd also been accepted at Johns Hopkins, but financial difficulties kept her from doing what she yearned to do. She took a summer course at the Marine Biological Laboratory in 1929, and then she did go to Johns Hopkins in the fall of 1929 to study zoology and genetics, and finally got her master's degree there in 1932. Uh, she wanted to also earn a PhD, but the depression and then her father's death left her to be the sole breadwinner to take care of her aging mother. She took a job with the U.S. Bureau of Fisheries. This was before it was part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Service, writing radio copy for a series called Under the Water, uh, which had never really caught on with people until she became the writer. She wrote 52 seven-minute programs on aquatic life for the general public, and they became very popular. She was then hired full-time as a junior aquatic biologist in 1936. She was the, the second person hired full-time, the second woman hired full-time. Uh, and that was to write reports and articles. But then in 1937, the next year, her sister died, leaving her the sole breadwinner now for her mother and two nieces. She wrote these books in the coming years. Um, and they became, uh, the first book wasn't noticed very much until the second two came out. And then they republished Under the Sea Wind and made them a trilogy. 
but she was an authority on the ocean and the whole environment along the shore and in deeper water of the sea. By 1945, the Bureau of Fisheries had been absorbed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and that's when she started working with my hero, Chandler Robbins. He was a scientist who uh, did a whole lot of the studies of bird numbers dealing uh, uh, and the impact of pesticides on them. And he's one of the people who encouraged her to write Silent Spring. Then in 1957, one of her nieces died and she had and she adopted her niece's five-year-old son, Roger. And at this point, the government was making all kinds of proposals for widespread pesticide spraying, exactly that DDT spraying in my neighborhood. And so she started doing really extensive research about it. She was writing Silent Spring, um, even uh, she was writing it in 1960 when she developed a duodenal ulcer and several infections. And right as she was finishing up the two chapters about cancer, she discovered a mass on her left breast. She had a mastectomy, but the cancer had already metastasized. The book came out in 1962, and that's the book that inspired my 101 Ways to Help Birds. My daughter and I came up with my working title of that, which was Resounding Spring, all the things we needed to do to prevent a silent spring. And my book is dedicated to Rachel Carson. Um, but um, so she, and she was so inspirational for so many people. When it was published, she was undergoing radiation therapy. Uh, the New Yorker serialization started with the June 16, 1962 issue. John Kennedy was president. She was attacked viciously before the book even came out, and it got terrible. Um, and the frustrating thing for a woman who had been responsible for raising her sister's children and then her niece's child, uh, people were uh, from the American Chemical Society and the pesticide lobby and the, and the companies that manufactured them were saying things like, she's a spinster, what does she care about genetics? Um, it was so frustrating reading the viciousness of the personal attacks she was taking. She didn't want anybody to know she had cancer because she thought that would make them attack her even more for having a hidden agenda and stuff. Uh, she was sick on and off the ever, um, after her book came out. But in early 1964, she was so sick uh, from respiratory viruses and anemia and her cancer spreading to her liver and she died that April. Her book, The Sense of Wonder, is based on essays she wrote about taking her nephew Roger to the sea and it was published after she died but she's an important hero. Margaret Morse Nice, you can tell she was married because she has three names like Florence, Mary, and Bailey. And she was born in 1883. So before uh, Florence Merriam's um, Birds uh, Through a, an Opera Glass came out. Um, and she, uh, when she was a child, got a Christmas present, Mabel Osgood Wright's Birdcraft, a field book of 200 song, game, and water birds, which came out in 1895, so after Birds Through an Opera Glass. But this is another woman who doesn't get credit for what she's done. Um, 
This book inspired Margaret Morse Nice to keep notes on local birds starting when she was 12. And she kept her notes and 61 years later, she used the notes taken when she was 13 to compare the rates of fledgling success of young robins, chipping sparrows and least flycatchers then and now. Um, so that was a cool book. She got a BA from Mount Holyoke College in 1906 in child psychology, and that's where she met her husband. And she got her master's degree in biology from Clark uh, in 1915. And meanwhile, she had five babies in 1911, 12, 16, 18, and 22. Her husband got a faculty job at the University of Oklahoma, and from 1913 to 1927, she studied Oklahoma birds and wrote a classic important book, The Birds of Oklahoma. Then she got fascinated with song sparrows, but this was not the only bird she studied. She wrote a lot of papers about all kinds of birds. And she started noticing when she would research a bird and it would tell her how many days it took for the eggs to incubate or how many days it took for the nestlings to fledge, that the dates were all screwed up and not at all like what they were in real life. And when she started doing literature searches backtracking, she found out that a lot of the ornithologists who had published this factual stuff had gotten their facts from Aristotle, who had seen that small birds, and he was using canaries, and um, medium-sized birds, and he was using chickens, he would set the incubation and um, hatching ages from those, and other people took that and extrapolated, which made no sense. She's the one who made people really study birds carefully. She banded quite a few song sparrows and she would trap them in the morning and in the evening and weigh them. And she already knew which bird it was because they already had a band on. And she's the one who proved, it was an obvious thing, but it was good to have proof that birds lose weight all night while they're sleeping, while they're not eating. But she tracked one male song sparrow for 24 hours. Um, she called him 4M and uh, she counted 2,305 songs in a single day, May 11th, 1935. And I love that because I saw my lifer warblers on May 11th, 1975. And so May 11th, and that's my half birthday. So I thought that's a cool date. But her bird spent roughly, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Her bird spent 10 hours singing, nine hours roosting, that was mainly overnight, and five hours eating and other miscellaneous activities. It would just get on a perch and sing for many minutes. And all those many minutes added up to 10 hours on that day. She wrote uh, this work, these are my copies of it, um, Dover Reprints has been great for the uh, Arthur Cleveland Bent books and these. Uh, two volumes of studies in the life history of the Song Sparrow. And so she's always been a huge hero of mine because of her work studying that bird. And now, we get to my last woman, the woman with three lives. I was teaching um, uh, one of the birding classes on Hog Island, Audubon's camp in Maine um, a few years ago, and a red-eyed vireo started singing. And I pointed it out and said that, um, one was tracked all day one day, and he sang 22,197 songs in one day. She was using a clicker for this. Well, anyway, 
my co-leader, who is a well-known, wonderful human being, um, whose wife was an incredibly important person for bird conservation. He said, yeah, it was done by a woman who had way too much time on her hands. And I knew that um, she, uh, her name was Louise de Kirlene De Lawrence. I knew that she had written a lot for Audubon, but I had nothing I could say beyond that. And I got very, very frustrated. So I had to find out everything I could about Louise de Kirlene Lawrence. And it turned out she had probably the most fascinating life of anybody. And again, she had family things happen that controlled her destiny in a lot of ways. She was born in Sweden and became, and she was born in 1894, so two years before my grandpa. And she became a nurse. And during World War I, she fell in love with a convalescing soldier from Russia and they got married. And she wrote a beautiful, touching um, account of this, a memoir after when she was much older. It, uh, but it was really beautiful. Another winter, another spring, a love remembered. And it's a beautiful book. But anyway, that was her first life. She was a nurse. Anyway, this was also during the Russian Revolution. And um, he got captured with her. They killed him. She managed to escape and fled to Canada, where she was a nurse, right? She became the nurse for the Dion quintuplets. During the whole time, those little babies and then toddlers and tiny children needed a nurse. She was their nurse, Louise de Caroline Lawrence. Then, after they didn't need her services anymore. She got married a second time um, and uh, moved to the woods in Canada, in the North Woods, and became a prolific student of natural history, especially birds. Uh, this is her one of her cards of a nest collected after it was the birds were done with it, but three eggs were embedded in it, apparently. In this third life, she wrote more than 500 reviews and 17 scientific papers for the American Ornithologist Union and seven books and was Audubon's most prolific writer. And she banded 20, over 25,000 birds. But a British ornithologist named Noble Rowland one day challenged people to devote one whole day to one special bird activity. So that was what inspired her to follow one red-eyed vireo from 3 a.m. through his heading to roost before sunset. And she did that on May 27th, 1952. And that's when she counted those 22,187 red-eyed vireo songs in one day. But while she was following him and clicking his songs on a clicker, she was also paying attention to everything else happening around her, taking copious notes and wrote a beautiful article about it for Audubon in 1954, Voluble Singer of the Treetops. And that article was included in her 1980 book, To Whom the Wilderness Speaks, which you can get on Kindle. And it also appeared in the 1999 book, Bright Stars, Dark Trees, Clear Water, Nature Writings from North of the Border. So you can read that beautiful article by this woman who did not have too much time on her hands. That still freaks me out that he could say that because this is one cool bird and this is one cool woman. So 
that's just a few of the women I could have talked about. Now we're getting into 2020 where this little male, presumably he'll be a bird watcher, um, started out. Uh, here he is. I had to get, plug him tonight because two different people bought my book this week when I published this picture on my blog. But um, what uh, what these women did was ensured that over my life, I'm seeing the birds I'm seeing and what my obligation and the obligations of women and men now are to make sure my little grandson Walter can see birds. And there were so many other women I wanted to talk about. There's Rosalie Edge, who was the woman famous for protecting Hawk Mountain to get people to stop shooting hawks there. There was Fran Hammerstrom, uh, who I knew personally. She was a wonderful woman, and um, she wrote some really charming children's stories, too. And Millicent Ficken, uh, Penny Ficken, uh, was one of the authorities on black-capped chickadees and especially on their vocalizations, and I adored her. And um, so, yeah, I named one of my nighthawks after her that I brought to an American Ornithologist Union meeting in Iowa when I was rehabbing, and I had to sneak it into my hotel room, and she snuck in to see it. It was pretty cool. Next time, we're going to be talking about warblers, my, um, because it's May, and May to me will always mean warblers. I will also, these are only Eastern warblers, but I promise I'll be covering some cool Western warblers too. And so that's the end. I hope you stay safe and well. And this time I have a red-eyed vireo asking if we have questions. So now, I'm going to allow people, if you have questions, um, I have to figure out how to do this to allow you to unmute yourself. Here it is. Um, so unmute yourself if you have a question. Ooh, Polly had 10 robins on her lawn. Um, it's, I have not had any on my lawn yet. And Penny lives out further away from the lake. So that may be helping. But anyway, you're allowed to unmute and if you or you can type anything into the, the chat if you have questions. I have a question. This uh -huh. is Kathy uh -huh. in, in Viroqua, Wisconsin. Um, I saw robins coming. Um, several weeks ago, the ground was still hard. And I wondered if I softened some raisins and threw them out for them, would they eat them? Um, they might, and they might come to mealworms. Tom Kensley in uh, Madison has them coming to his dried mealworms. Um, I'm envious, but uh, robins have to figure out bird feeders. It's not something that most of them grow up knowing about. Their parents don't take them to feeders. So when they notice other birds going to a window feeder or a tray, they might figure it out. But some of them do figure it out pretty quickly. And yes, you can put out frozen blueberries, frozen raspberries, um, raisins, and um, they'll freeze if the weather's frozen out there. But that's why I say start with frozen rather than trying to get fresh because it's going to freeze anyway. Um, but when they figure it out, they'll uh, be pretty reliable. I had a pair one summer when I was putting live mealworms in a window right next to my desk and they would just come and uh, it was funny because you could watch them eating. These were live mealworms and they might eat six or seven and then all of a sudden it would click in their brain, wait, I'm not supposed to be eating. I'm supposed to be bringing food to the kids <laughs> and they would just switch from eating them to just stuffing them across their beak and fly off to feed the kids. Um, so it was really cool. The thing about the robins moving in March, 
And even sometimes, not this year probably, but sometimes when we're having very wintry weather still in April, those are still the last robins of winter, not the first robins of spring. They're still focused on going to fruit trees for mm. their meals. All of a sudden, when we usually right around the 37 degree isotherm, when your day night average temperatures, roughly 37 degrees, that clicks off something where, because the ground is just getting thawed enough that uh, they might be able to find some worms, uh, especially if they're near a shoreline and stuff. And that's when they start getting territorial. That's when they start singing. Now, the 10 that were in uh, the, um, Polly's lawn, those birds were a migratory flock or a wintering flock. Uh, once they're territorial, they get out of the flock, they start singing, and they get much more agitated about other robins. Thank you. And Kathy said robins will eat grapes. Yeah, they, they do eat grapes. Don't feed them to your dog, though. <laughs> Uh, Charlene asked if most of the books I mentioned are out of print. Uh, one of the cool things is a lot of them have been uh, entered into Project Gutenberg, which is a free online service where you can get these books in Kindle form if you read them on a Kindle or in several ebook e formats uh, to read these wonderful old books that don't really have a market. But some of them are still in print. And I was delighted when I uh, first had to defend um, uh, Louise de Caroline Lawrence. Uh, I immediately found her book, her memoir about her and her husband, her first husband. And then I started reading her bird stuff and it was really, really cool. Oh, Penny. She got her first look at a baby great horned owl in the nest across her street. I am so envious. I cannot figure out where my neighborhood pair of great horned owls is nesting, but um, really cool. Oh, Michelle, thank you so much for buying my book. Yeah, Florence Merriam's book. And it's funny with her because she got married after she'd already published books. Uh, some of her books are Florence Merriam and some of them are Florence Merriam Bailey. Nothing that Margaret Morse Nice um, published came out before she was married. So she always went by the three names. So what else am I missing? Anything? Not yet. Uh, any other questions? You could turn on your microphone. I, I said it so you could, uh, we're welcome to unmute. Yeah, if you don't know how to unmute, you can use, um, if you pull up the participant thing, you can click on the little microphone. Or in your bottom left corner of your screen, it has a mute button. And if it, it should be red right now. And if you click it, it'll turn green. I think what I, um, what I find so empowering learning about these women is uh, they lived in a different time when um, they didn't have as much control over their lives because they were the ones expected to do so much to keep their families going. And um, so they didn't have options like Althea Sherman. She wanted to be an artist, but when she decided she was going to study birds instead, though she did do a lot of bird painting. But she 
just became consumed with that. She was very shy. She did take people occasionally on tours of her tower, but when she did, um, she really wanted everybody to be quiet and not bother the birds. And she was very much an introvert. And, you know, it, I just love knowing how much cool things these people could do. She said she was as good with science as she was because she had taken Greek and Latin at Oberlin College and that made it easier for her to understand scientific nomenclature and things like that. Um, really um, how they used the time in their life with what was going on and affecting them. I think in some ways, the one who was the most inspirational was Rachel Carson being so articulate and doing so much and she never wanted to get rid of DDT. That was never what she was asking for. What she wanted was for people to use it as a last measure and to find better ways of controlling insect pests because she knew that one by one, the insect pests would become resistant. And that happened very quickly with DDT where they had to keep raising the amounts they were releasing in the environment because the mosquitoes, enough of them were surviving and having babies who were even more resistant than they were, that DDT has never solved problems when applied uh, to the environment. DDT is still legal. The World Health Organization still recommends it. And I still recommend it in places where uh, malaria and other horrifying illnesses are, but not to apply it to the environment. When mosquitoes land, on something that is coated with DDT, it gets taken up by the little tissues in their feet and kills them. And so if people spray the upper walls and ceilings of in, uh, mosquito infested places and have the, um, uh, the bed curtains, um, if they're drenched in DDT or in one of the things that they use to uh, insect shield or all the different products they have now that killed them on contact, it doesn't need to be in the environment. And once it's dry, we don't have to worry about breathing it. So it is so much safer. Laura, it's Donna, Debbie. Uh, hi. Uh, just wanted to say, oh, you know, all these women, so, so impressive and so inspirational. Uh, Rachel Carson, now, you know, I, I worked at Brookfield Zoo in the Play Zoo for many, many years. Uh, we considered Rachel Carson as something of a patron saint on the basis of her, you know, the, the book, The Sense of Wonder. Uh, it is so important for us to stay connected to nature and certainly birding is a way to do it. So many people now, uh, we're, we're so disconnected. And just, just to bring these women back to the fore. And I mean, in this group, you're kind of speaking to the choir, but we will be able to share these stories and share the, uh, the, the beautiful story of Rachel Carson, the spinster who doesn't know anything about progeny, my goodness, what a lie, but she has inspired so many people to stay connected, to keep your kids connected. Now, you know, we, we both have grandkids and I'm lucky enough to have a great grand who just turned a year. I want Walter and I want Amaris to have every opportunity to see all the wonders of nature. And that doesn't happen without inspirational people like that who have come before us. Thank you for a wonderful evening. Thank you Hello. for coming, Debbie. <laughs> oh, Don, uh, 
uh, said that 90 minutes east mm -hmm. of St. Paul in February in a swamp, uh, they came upon a flock of robins hanging out and they were silent. They don't sing in winter and they don't sing in flocks because when robins hear another robin sing, male robins, when they hear another male robin sing, it increases their stress levels and they need to either get territorial themselves or they need to get out of dodge. So that's what, um, so they don't sing when it's healthier for them to stay in a flock. And they do like swamps because um, the ground can be um, wetter and, you know, um, they can get more food, but they need berry bushes of some kind or another um, or apple trees or stuff. Yeah, I wrote about uh, children and birds in the very first uh, Good Birders Don't Wear White. Um, yeah, they asked me to write one about that. I, I wrote a book called Sharing the Wonder of Birds with Kids back in 1997, I think. Um, that one was about my experiences as a teacher, as a mother, as a Girl Scout leader and Brownie leader, and someone who helped um, uh, Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts um, with their uh, Bird Study Merit Badge. And the Bird Study Merit Badge book is really good to use with kids. It was actually written by Scott Wiedensall, who himself is an Eagle Scout. Um, so, uh, and he has been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for one of his books about birds, uh, bird migration. And he's just a wonderful man, but he's the one who wrote the Boy Scout book. And uh, Rachel Carson w did do a lot of birding, but no, she was, um, she did not write about any particular species. She, uh, her work, um, she did use what was happening with peregrine falcons and bald eagles and robins um, it, as part of her book, but her natural history writing was in general about um, the ocean and the shoreline. And she wrote a lot about the birds that were part of that environment. But, um, no, she didn't write specifically about birds. Um, Pip, are you around? Somebody wants to see my dog, but I don't think she's in here tonight. I think uh, she wanted dinner and stayed with uh, my husband. Any other questions? Doesn't sound like it. I hope everybody pays attention to birds where it's April now. And you all know, of course, that April 27th is a great big important uh, holiday. It's Ulysses S. Grant's birthday. And I have a picture of him wearing binoculars, uh, but he wasn't a bird watcher, and, but he definitely was not a bird hunter. When he was stationed in Texas during the Mexican War, he was supposed to go out with one of the other soldiers to shoot a bunch of birds to bring back for them to eat. And he went outside with the gun and he watched all these cranes flying over and all these geese flying over, and he could not bring himself to point the gun at any of them. And so it's not a male female thing, the hunting thing. Like I said, Fran Hammerstrom liked to hunt, but a lot of men don't. It's not male or female. That's just a personal, whether you like to play predator or whether you identify with the prey.